four terrifying killers from the 1970s. It's estimated there's more than 2,000 active serial killers in the United States today, but times were different in the 70s. Sure, it was the decade of peace and love, but countless serial killers also roamed the streets, taking advantage of those happy times and hunting their prey with ease. These are four terrifying killers from the 1970s. Number four, Gennady Mikasevic. Russian Gennady Mikasevic isn't your typical serial killer because for much of his life, he was relatively normal. Gennady was born in Palas in 1947. On May 14, 1971, he came back from military service to find out his girlfriend had left him and even worse, had married someone else. After the breakup, he contemplated suicide several times. Then, while on the road heading to his parents' house, he came across a young woman. They didn't fall in love and live happily ever after, though. Instead, to vent his anger and frustration, he killed the girl by strangling her, and that was just the beginning. After that, he killed another girl in October and two other women in 1972. Come 1973, Gennady graduated from technical school and started work. Three years later, he married and had two children, but behind the scenes, the murders went on. He found a job at a machine repair service, and his outward appearance was that of a family man and serious worker. The seemingly random killings of the women in the area continued to escalate, and by the 1980s, investigators finally realized all these killings could be connected. In 1985, Gennady escalated his rage by killing 12 women in that year alone. He never stuck to one type of murder weapon either, and in fact used various items that he would find just lying around. His murders were mainly to facilitate rape, but he also robbed victims of their money and valuable items, sometimes even giving those as a gift to his wife. In retaliation for the expanding crime spree, police tightened the noose and pursued the killer even more. Realizing this, Gennady decided to lead investigators away from him by writing an anonymous letter to the local newspaper. He made it look like it belonged to an imaginary underground group that called themselves the Patriots of Vitebsk. The letter contained a call for the fellow members to continue their killings of communists and lewd women. He then left a similar note with another victim. When police noticed this, they decided to examine the handwriting of the letter against the male residents of Oblast. After checking more than 500,000 samples, police realized the handwriting bore a striking resemblance against that of Gennady. After further investigation, they obtained more evidence convincing them that Gennady was the perpetrator. In December of 1985, he was finally arrested. He confessed and was executed two years later. His case became controversial not just for his crimes, but because it showed how inept and corrupt the police were. Apparently, prior to his arrest, 14 people were arrested and convicted for the crimes Gennady had committed because they were tortured and forced to confess. Number three, Dean Coral. Known as the Candyman or the Pied Piper, Dean earned his nickname since he would often give children free candy. His family ran a candy store in Houston, Texas, but when the business closed, Dean trained to become an electrician. Soon he ended up making friends with young male teens instead of guys his own age. One of the first he befriended was then 12-year-old David Brooks, who became a constant companion to Dean, looking up to him as a father figure. By 1969, a sexual relationship had developed, and Dean would give Brooks gifts and money in exchange. In 1970, Dean killed his first known victim, 18-year-old Jeffrey Conan. It's believed the killer offered him a ride while he was hitchhiking, and he accepted. Brooks soon caught Dean assaulting two teenage boys, so Dean offered to give him a car in exchange for his silence, and he accepted. He was then offered $200 for every single person that he could lure to Dean's apartment. With the promise of partying and drugs, Brooks brought in and assisted in killing nine boys in 1971 alone. All of the boys invited into Coral's apartment were given drugs or booze, then attacked and strapped to a torture device where they would be electrocuted, raped, and sadistically tortured before being killed. Soon, 15-year-old Elmer Henley joined in bringing in more boys. 
Henley was supposed to be a victim, but Coral decided he would make a good accomplice instead. He was also paid $200 per boy. Henley participated in abducting, killing, and torturing more than 20 boys between 1971 and 1973. On August 7, 1973, Henley brought Timothy Curley as an intended victim to the apartment. They were getting drunk and then left to grab a sandwich, but before returning to the home, Henley dropped by Rhonda Williams' house. Rhonda had just been beaten by her father and wanted to leave. The trio went to Dean's place, and when he saw that there was a girl, he lashed out at Henley, telling him he ruined everything. Henley explained Rhonda's situation, and eventually Dean did calm down. He then offered the three beers and weed, and after that they all passed out. When Henley woke up, he was handcuffed and his legs were bound. He saw Timothy and Rhonda were also bound and gagged and that Tim was already stripped naked. Dean dragged Henley to the kitchen and threatened to shoot him with a 22 caliber pistol until he promised he would participate in the torture, rape, and murder of the pair. Dean gave Henley a hunting knife to cut away William's clothes. At that moment, the two teens, heavily drugged and in a stupor, were finally waking up. While Henley began cutting away the clothes, she asked him, Is this for real? And he replied, Yes. Then she asked him, Are you going to do anything about it? All of a sudden, Henley grabbed Dean's pistol, shouting at him that things had gone far enough. Dean taunted Henley to shoot him as he approached, and that's exactly what he did. He fired several rounds into the sadistic killer until he died, and then afterwards, the three teens called the police. Cops were initially skeptical about Henley's story until he told them where they could find most of the bodies. He first led them to Dean's boat shed, where they found eight bodies, and several others were found in other areas after that. When the investigation was all said and done, there were a total of 28 confirmed victims, but police believed there could be as many as 47 in total. Brooks surrendered to the cops but maintained his silence while Henley willingly spoke about the murders and helped police. In the end, both Henley and Brooks were sentenced to life in prison. Number 2. William Bonin In a span of less than a year, from August of 1979 to June of 1980, William Bonin haunted the freeways of Los Angeles and Orange County, California. Worse, while Bonin was vicious on his own, he also had several other accomplices who actively participated in his killings. Born William George Bonin on January 8, 1947, the twice-paroled sex offender grew up in a dysfunctional family. Both his parents were alcoholics who left him and his two brothers in the care of their grandfather, a convicted child molester himself. By 1961, the family moved to California, and it was in this new home on Angel Street in Downey that Bodin would molest his younger brother as well as various neighborhood kids. After finishing high school, he got engaged and joined the Air Force. He was on active duty in Vietnam for five months where he said he had consensual sex with both men and women. However, he also admitted to sexually assaulting two soldiers at gunpoint. This was never reported, but still, Bonin was discharged from the military in 1968. When he returned home, he got married for a brief time before divorcing. At age 21, in November of 1968, he committed several sexual assaults for which he was caught and sentenced to five years in jail. He was later released with doctors deeming him no longer a danger to the health and safety of others. The following year, he encountered 14-year-old David McVicker hitchhiking. He raped the young boy, but eventually let him go. Bonin was caught and returned to prison for an additional four years for this. He was again released, and that's when he vowed never to get caught again choosing to kill his victims from here on out. He soon met his most active accomplice in Vernon Butts. By this time, Bonin had acquired a job as a truck driver, had a girlfriend, and was known for allowing teens and minors to party at his apartment. Together with Butts and his later accomplices, William Pugh, James Monroe, and Gregory Milley, Bonin attacked and killed 21 young boys, but police suspect him of killing an additional 15. His targets were mainly young male hitchhikers, male prostitutes, or schoolboys. He would entice them to his car or abduct them with the help of whichever accomplice was with him at the time. 
He would bound his victims, and then after that, they were sexually assaulted, beaten, tortured, and strangled using the victim's own shirts. The majority of these victims were killed in his van, their bodies dumped along or near the freeways in Southern California. By the early 80s, the crime spree became frequent, and police were on a manhunt for the perpetrators. In May of 1980, William Pugh was arrested for auto theft, and when he overheard details of the abduction cases, he confided to his counselor that it sounded a lot like something William Bonham would do. His counselor in turn relayed the information to the LAPD. A previous victim, David McVickers, also called in a tip stating that the killer might be Bonham. As a result, police investigated him and found disturbing patterns in his background of sexual assaults. Police began their surveillance and finally caught him on the ninth day when he was attempting to rape and strangle a young runaway in the back of his van. At first, he denied the charges, but was moved to confess later on. While he showed no signs of remorse, he did feel deeply embarrassed for having been caught. His other accomplices were later captured as well. William Bonham was executed via lethal injection on February 23, 1996. His accomplice, Vernon Butts, committed suicide in prison on January 11, 1981. Meanwhile, Gregory Milley was sentenced to life in prison and was killed in a brawl on May 25, 2016. James Monroe is still serving his sentence and will be up for parole in 2019, and William Pugh served only six years in prison and was released in 1985. Number 1. Paul John Knowles Given up to foster homes and reformatories at a young age by his father, Paul John Knowles grew up in a bad environment. In 1974, by the time he was 19, he was incarcerated for petty crime, and it was here he began correspondence with a San Francisco divorcee named Angela Kovic. During a prison visit, Knowles proposed to her, and oddly, she agreed. She then hired him a legal counsel and became instrumental in getting him out of prison. Afterwards, Knowles flew to California to live with her. However, a psychic told Angela that a dangerous man was going to enter her life, so she ended the relationship with him and canceled the wedding. According to Knowles, the same night she broke off their engagement, he became so enraged that he killed three people on the streets of San Francisco. He then went back to Florida, and while there got into a fight with a bartender and stabbed him. Knowles was sent back to jail but escaped his cell on July 26, 1974. It was here that he became a wanted fugitive and a murderous killer. On the exact night of his escape, he broke into the home of 65-year-old Alice Curtis. He gagged and bound her, took money and valuables, and then left with her car. Alice would later die from the attack by choking on her own dentures. While in the process of abandoning the car, he recognized two family acquaintances of his, 11-year-old Lillian and 7-year-old Millette Anderson. Fearing the girls would identify him, he kidnapped and strangled them both before burying their bodies near a swamp. He then picked up a young girl hitchhiking and killed her, and it wasn't until 2011 when she was identified as 13-year-old Ema Jean Sanders. On August 2, 1974, he either forced his way or was invited by Marjorie Howie up to her apartment in Atlantic Beach. Here, he strangled her with a nylon stocking and then stole her TV. This was just a day after he killed the two children. From here, he was next seen in Georgia where he killed Kathy Sue Pierce. She was strangled with a telephone cord, but a three-year-old son was left unharmed. On September 3rd, he was spotted in Lima, Ohio, where he met accountant William Bates at a bar. Around this time, police actually found Alice Curtis's vehicle, and the following month discovered Bates' naked body decomposing in the woods. Knowles, now with Bates' car, passed through Nevada and killed two elderly campers. Then, in Sequin, Texas, he abducted, raped, and killed Charlene Hicks. By September 23rd, he traveled to Birmingham, Alabama, where he killed Ann Dawson. The two had traveled together for some time until she was killed on the 29th. He continued on to Marlboro, Connecticut, where he forced entry into Karen Wine's home. He raped and killed her along with her 16-year-old daughter, Dawn. Both were strangled using nylon stockings, and the only thing missing was their videotape recorder. 
Knowles went on to kill another victim, Doris Hosey, in Virginia by October 18th. At one point, Knowles picked up two hitchhikers intending to kill them, but was shocked when he was stopped by a patrol officer for a traffic violation. This officer had no idea the car was stolen or who Knowles was and ended up letting him off the hook. Shaken by this, he decided not to kill the pair and simply dropped them off in Miami where they asked. He soon headed back out and surfaced in Milledgeville, Georgia, where he befriended another woman named Carswell Carr. Once back at her home, he killed her along with her 15-year-old daughter. Days later, he met a British journalist, Sandy Fox. They parted ways without incident, but days later, Knowles cornered Susan McKenzie and threatened her at gunpoint for sex. She escaped and informed cops, but when officers tried to apprehend Knowles, he brandished a shotgun and got away. His crime spree ended, however, in Florida, where he kidnapped one woman, but eventually let her go. On November 17th, he wrestled a gun from a patrol officer who was attempting to arrest him and made off of the patrol car and took the officer hostage. After that, he stopped another vehicle and took another person hostage before leading the two into a wooded area, handcuffing them, and shooting them in their heads. Knowles then tried to drive through a police roadblock in Georgia, but failed and set off on foot. He would have managed to escape as he was off the police search grid, but local citizens captured him. In custody, he said he killed 35 people, but police could only link him to 20. On December 18, 1974, Paul John Knowles was traveling down Interstate 20 with two detectives. According to the story, he was leading them to the murder weapon that killed the two hostages in the woods. Apparently, Knowles wrestled for the gun, and the other detective had no choice but to shoot him in the chest, killing him. So those were four terrifying killers from the 1970s. There are plenty of reasons why the 70s seemed to be a decade for serial killers. There was no organized system tracking these killings, and police rarely communicated with one another outside their jurisdiction. While there's a general decline in serial killers today, there's no doubt they're still out there lurking, even at this very moment. If you enjoyed this video, then please subscribe to our channel and hit the notification bell because each Wednesday and Saturday we have new videos coming out. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon.